This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Hi, my name is Peter Tomasi. Hi, this is James Tynan IV. Hi, I'm Dan Jerkin. Hey, I'm Duncan Wynn. This is Jim Lee. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Mark Hamill speaking. This is Kevin Conroy. This is Tim Sale. Hello, everyone. I'm Batman, and you're listening to my podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Batman Universe Comic Podcast, Season 12, Episode 10, Legacy Episode Number 297. I'm Ian, and I have with me Stefan Theo. Hola. Today, we're going through Batman White Knight, the complete miniseries by Sean Murphy and colored by Matt Hollingsworth. Um, this month, as I said last episode, will be the night, uh, the month of White Knight. We're going to be doing the first miniseries this week, and then in two weeks, we'll do the second miniseries. However, we have some news. Comics are trickling back this month. We've already had Batman and the Outsiders, and this week we're also going to have Harley Quinn coming out, new issues. So in June, when all of the Bat Family books are scheduled to return normally, we're going to get back to our normal schedule. We'll also be building to episode number 300. So we're not going to do like an all-out bash, but we are going to try and make it a bit special with some reminiscence and maybe some special guest stars. So look forward to that in the month of June in the Batman Universe comic podcast. All right, so go ahead. Does that mean uh, we're finally going to get Harper Row on? (laughs) (laughs) Harper is a fictional character. How would we have her as a guest? I don't know. We we I, I, I just remember you know, a few years ago, you know, Ed and and Steph was begging Dustin to get mm-hmm. Harper on the show for an episode or two. So I would I would love to see that happen. Well, what we really someone named Harper Row. What we really need to do is have Duke Harper and uh, Joker's daughter do a podcast, and then we'll lose all our subscribers. <laughs> All right, so let's get to our reviews. We're going to be reading a summaries of all eight issues of Batman White Knight. Every issue is written and drawn by Sean Murphy, and the colors are all by Matt Hollingsworth. So, issue one. The Joker has been cured. A year ago, Batman... Batgirl and Nightwing brutally captured the Joker, and he went on a pill regime which got his psychoses under control. Now calling himself Jack Napier, he's gone into politics, claiming he can make Gotham a better place. Batman, meanwhile, has become withdrawn and violent as Alfred's health deteriorates drastically. Jack reveals the first part of his plan as he sues Gotham for partnering with Batman. Nightwing! What are you doing here? Oh, just following a pattern of obsessive behavior instilled in me at an early age. You should work on your stealth skills. I heard you're coming halfway across the roof. Good to see you, too. After the opening statements of his lawsuit, Jack apologizes to Harley and proposes marriage. However, it turns out that the current Harley is a replacement. Batman, Batgirl, and Mr. Freeze fail in their attempts to save Alfred through science. The original Harley explains to Jack about her replacement after she left when Joker tried to kill Robin, who has disappeared, or even Joker doesn't remember. Jack and Harley use Clayface and Mad Hatter to control all the villains in Gotham. Oh, maybe I'd feel better if I knew he missed me, too. Harley's replacement, abandoned by the Joker, is outraged as Joker himself sends all of his mind-controlled villains to attack the banks. Batman and the GCPD fight back as Jack and Harley execute their real mission, finding documents in an old law office. Batman, 
severely injured collapses at Alfred's bedside as Jack broadcasts a speech on TV. Claiming Batman only cares about the rich. Alfred sacrifices his own life to save Bruce, leaving Batman with fewer and fewer connections to humanity. As Holly's replacement discovers the truth of Jack's control over the supervillains. Are you the famous Batman so intent upon destroying my happiness that you'll harm these poor, mind-warped innocents to get me? As Jack runs for city councilman, endorsed by former Marine and current community organizer Duke Thomas, Batman breaks up the rally or protest, further alienating the people of his city. Harley proposes marriage to Jack, and he accepts while Harley's replacement, calling herself Neo-Joker, attacks the GCPD with the mind-controlled supervillains, leading to further stress between Gordon and Batman. Neo-Joker attempts to get the Joker back, but Jack refuses, instead forming the GTO, making the partnership between the police and Batman's allies official. We could play in this all day, Missy. Nothing you can do hurts me. As Jack prepares for his inevitable showdown with Batman by training and taking steroids, Batman pursues Neo-Joker and fends off the offer of the GTO. Confronting Harley, Batman refuses to accept Jack is not truly the Joker. Neo-Joker attacks Wayne Manor, uncovering dark connections between Thomas, Mr. Freeze, and Nazi Germany. Gordon declares Batman a super criminal, just as Neo-Joker discovers a giant freeze gun. I can only beg your forgiveness and pray you'll hear me somehow, some place, some place where a warm hand waits for mine. The GTO attempts to arrest Batman, alienating his allies, and Jack uses his training and drug-enhanced strength to beat Batman, putting him in office. Neo Joker uses the freeze cannon to blast the city, holding all of Gotham hot hostage until she gets Jack the Joker back. Lost without his longtime foe, Jack consumes a large number of pills and reverts back to the Joker. Or should I say, Jason Todd? I thought you were dead. You said I was dead? No. He wishes I was dead. As Jack and Joker war for possession of his body and mind, Harley convinces him that to stop Neo-Joker without becoming the Joker permanently again, he must work with Batman. Batman agrees on the condition that Joker tell him what happened to Robin, Jason Todd, who Jack reveals is alive, but stays away because he now hates Batman. Jack and Batman devise a plan to fight Neo-Joker, though Joker continues to resurface, and Batman reconciles with Nightwing and Batgirl as they head off to execute their plan. Just say the word and I'll call it all. <coughs> Till death do us part. Hmm? Fine. Killer. Joker takes control of Jack, saying he's more useful to Batman. The GTO launches an all-out assault on the freeze cannon, and Neo-Joker loses control of the supervillains, leading to complete chaos. Mr. Freeze manages to reverse the effects of the freeze cannon with the GTO, and Batman saves Jack while Harley captures Neo-Joker. Jack honors his deal with Batman to surrender to Arkham, as Joker cannot be suppressed for good. In the asylum, Jack and Harley marry, but Joker returns at the end of the ceremony. In the aftermath, Batman reveals that the whole plot was created by Harley to get Joker back, or to get Jack back, and break the endless war between Batman and the Joker. He then unmasks to Gordon and allies with the GTO. So, as you can tell, even though we've cut our summaries down quite a bit to fit within our runtime, there's an awful lot that happens in these eight issues. So um, before we get too deep into our commentary and analysis, Steph had some fascinating insights into the sales of this miniseries. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So most books, like if you're lucky between your first, your number one, and everyone buys the number one or buys three of them so they could sell them online or whatever, you're lucky then if by the end of the series you've only lost about 
of your sales. Um, since I've been doing this, um, I think the best I've ever seen was Doomsday Clock. And I forget what that is. Anyway, but that had a really, like, your first and final sales were actually really, really close. I'll look that up later. But um, White Knight had a difference of 15% in sales. So it started with eighty, almost 87K, and it ended with almost 74K, which is pretty crazy. Which means that it it kept a pretty consistent and dedicated reader base, which is pretty awesome. And that it was it was that high. I mean, it never reached hundred k, but for these limited series that don't um, cater to everyone, like something like Injustice or or um, Deceased, where it's you know everyone's characters are in there, or even um, Doomsday Clock that I just mentioned. <laughs> so so this was actually pretty cool to see this book do so well. I would think those numbers would have would have kept it in the top ten, top fifteen each month. Definitely, and the fact that it stayed so steady, I think that's why DC really wants to continue on with the with the White Knight universe because it's even even um, Curse of the White Knight. It didn't do near as well. It started off better, but then it did lose readership and and, and lost about forty two percent of its readership and ended up lower than White Knight, but still did pretty good. And I can understand why why they want to keep up with the um, with this universe. Well, when we talk about potential sequels, we'll definitely want to focus on that more next episode when we talk about Curse of the White Knight. Mm-hmm. And Murphy has also, I think he said that he's going to work with other artists to create one shots similar to his um, Mister Freeze or Von Freeze. Uh, one shot that we did a Patreon exclusive episode with um, Chris, myself, and Steph. I think you were on that, right? Yes, I was on that one. Yeah. Yes, and that um, was an amazing one shot. It was. It was. That's my favorite piece from this universe. I thought it was just so well done, and I definitely would recommend that you become a patron so you can hear that episode. I, I was just going to say, but that was actually destined for this series, and I think I think Murphy said for some reason he he took it out right well the series already ballooned from seven issues to eight so he didn't want to add even more content so he decided to take it out and make it a one shot during the publication of the new miniseries right but yes it does fit between the last couple of issues of this um and and it it makes this story i think a lot richer i'm very glad i read i read the the von fries before sitting down and, and reading this in, in its entirety. So I read it when it first came out, but uh, I think I zoomed through it, so I, I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> but it really added a depth to Freeze's character that you really don't get from, from the book. Completely agree. And I think that... I, I'm very curious to see how it's released. I wonder if it'll be released as part of White Knight, Curse of the White Knight trade paperback, or if it'll be like part of a deluxe, or if it'll get his own... I guess we'll have to wait and see because if he releases more one shots like that, he could have like from the pages of White Knight or something, you know, mm-hmm. and have its own trade. Because it was a long story, like it was like sixty pages, it was a good chunk. But yeah, so this was very, very popular, and so let's have a, a couple of discussion questions. Let's analyze this baby. What difference does this series make to the DC universe? Like it has little differences, like the fact that Mister Freeze is heroic and a longtime ally of the Wayne family. So how do you think these little changes work? Uh, which ones would you highlight as being especially interesting? And do you think that the main DC universe should follow some of these changes? Oh, well, that would... No. So then you'd just be copying it, I think, at this point. Well, I'm... but I'm going to bring up The Dark Knight Rises later, and the DC universe copied a lot of The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> Um, Didn't say it made sense. <laughs> I liked this because, the, well, for one thing, there's two Harleys in here. There's a lot of like minor changes, like the fact that uh, Jason Todd was the original uh, Robin, and just the details of his torture were just ever so slightly different. Um, and then the outcome was different. But and there's just tiny tweaks here and there that just allow you to tell a different kind of story, but not like jar you so horribly that that you're like this isn't batman this is something completely different it's like no no this is still batman it's just 
he's tweaked it a bit. So like Duke Thomas is a former is a former Marine, right? And he's an adult. He's not a teenager. And I actually really liked his character. I, I like this Duke Thomas a lot. I, I like wish. Him. Yes, I, I do. You know, if they're going to age up like John, you know, Superboy, why can't they age up Duke and make him this awesome character, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this, like, this for, is a Duke Thomas I could definitely work with. Yes, I love this Duke Thomas. And the two Harleys was interesting. And one thing I kind of got out of it was it almost explained her change from pre-New 52 to New 52 in that they were two completely different people. And I thought that was – they don't explicitly say that that's, that's what it is, but that's that's what I got out of it is that that when they changed to the more horrible, you know, mean Harley that, that you can kind of use your imagination that that's – when it happened. Well, I'm really curious to see if Punchline is similar to Neo Joker at all. Because I feel like this is, yeah. this feels so much like, um, you know, what they're doing with Punchline. Now, of course, we've only seen hints of Punchline, but of course, James Tynan has written <laughs> like essays about his creation of Punchline because <laughs> he just loves to talk, uh, which is good. Like, he, he doesn't talk like Alan Moore where it's like, I am such a great writer. He's like, oh man, I'm so excited about these action figures I have. <laughs> Um, which I, I relate to being a huge nerd, but I, I am curious to see if that is one of the, the sort of ripple effects that the series has is this sort of bifurcation or meta commentary through creation of new characters like Neo Joker that become part of the main universe through something like punchline. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. But those were the major minor differences that I really enjoyed and made this made it able to write a new story and that and, and freeze like i said becoming a, a more interesting character again not so much in this book but once you pair this with uh with the um one shot it's definitely makes him more interesting and for interesting storytelling my my simple answer is no uh you know it shouldn't be copied by the main DCU, yeah. Um, it, it, it leave well enough alone because the DCU <laughs> has its own problems anyway that needs some fixing. Uh, Are you telling me that the DC universe is not a perfect, <laughs> perfect masterpiece of a universe? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but no. It, it, it. I mean, if there was ever, if there was ever an Elseworld series that could just continue on on its own. Um, the White Knight universe is is probably it, and and definitely needs to be left alone. And you know, let let Murphy be the the Hickman of DC, and let him you know pick those he wants to partner with him, whether it's on the art itself or uh, these other creators who's going to be doing these one shots. You know, just Give him the reins with that and, and leave him be um, because he's, he's actually done a great job with both series, um, at least in my opinion. Um, it was funny that Steph mentioned Mr. Freeze, and I know when, that, when we did um, we did our review two weeks ago on Lil Gotham, I mentioned of how one of the things I've always appreciated was how uh, Freeze was humanized, you know, and, and seeing that actually a good guy who was just put in a bad spot. But we kind of see this in White Knight, where, you know, in the end, Freeze becomes the good guy that, you know, I've always seen him as, as just being a good guy in a rough spot, wanting to save his wife and has to go through these drastic measures to, to accomplish that goal. Um, but it's good to see him in the light of, you know, yes, I'm, I'm going to use this weapon that was created and used to hold Gotham hostage to save Gotham, and I'm going to be a good guy as well. So I, I definitely enjoyed that. Definitely. I think that for me, there's a bit of a problem with there's perhaps too many good ideas in this series that not all of them can get the focus that I think they deserve. For example, Batgirl and Nightwing are really very background characters in this series, whereas yeah. 
you know, their solo characters in their own right. So I would have loved to see much more focus on, you know, Gordon and Batgirl and Nightwing. But when Murphy does focus on a character like Mr. Freeze or Joker or Harley or, of course, Batman himself, um, he does really bring an interesting voice to them and present uh, a fascinating what if, while still, I would say, definitely being true to at least versions of those characters. Obviously, this is not the Joker that you'd see Greg Rucka write. This is much more, and I think Murphy's acknowledged this, this is much more Batman the Animated Series, you know, Mark Hamill's Joker, where he's mostly in it because he thinks it's funny, whereas Greg Rucka's Joker and Scott Snyder's Joker are avatars of evil and chaos, and they think that the world is meaningless and they want to, sh- to destroy the world because it has no meaning. Whereas this Joker... Actually, to segue into my next question, do you think that this Joker and Batman have a kind of romantic relationship? Now, obviously, they don't kiss or make out or even embrace, but when Joker loses control after he beats Batman and puts him in Arkham, it does sort of remind you of someone who's, you know, gotten revenge on their ex and then doesn't know what to do with themselves. And I would argue that Scott Snyder writes the Joker very similarly in respect to the fact that he is obsessed in an almost romantic way with the Batman. Uh, Do you read this that way, or do you think that that might be stretching a bit far? Um, The first thing I wanted to say was, for all, I don't know if I know any, I don't know if I want to know if I know any, but there is a demographic in the Batman universe that loves shipping Batman and Joker together. And I have accidentally stumbled on some of the fan fiction, which is one of the big reasons I stopped reading Batman fan fiction. <laughs> but um, if you are looking for a DC sanctioned book, this is as close as you're going to get, I think, to shipping Batman and Joker. But that being said, nothing, like you said, nothing actually happens. This is all um, in Joker's mind. And I think that for Napier, since Napier is the more sane kind of pre-Joker, I don't know if Napier necessarily has that. He does kind of have a a crush, I guess, or a fanboy, not yet obsession, I don't think. Which is why, yeah, that scene where he beats him up and takes him to Arkham is kind of super tragic for him um but joker on the other hand they really kind of play up the full obsession and like that's why he didn't even notice that harley had was a different person (laughs) was that he was just so singularly obsessed with batman everything else kind of just faded into the background became secondary to to just complete and total fanboy um so i don't know necessarily if it's Again, it's not romance, but yes, I do feel like there is something akin to love in Jack or Joker that definitely comes through and is part of the narrative. So I'm, uh, I'm going to take it a little step further. I kind of, if you look across the various genres, including comics, Batman and Joker has always had a relationship. You know, whether you're looking at the Lego Batman movie, whether you're looking at uh, the Dark Knight Rise, I mean, not the Dark Knight Rise, well, you're looking at the Dark Knight where Joker won't let anyone get after Batman and he tells him, you know, I don't want to kill you. We, we, we're destined to be together. So there's always been a sense of a relationship between these two in one shape or, or form or, or in one shape or form and this one kind of takes it just a tad bit further now again you know as Steph said it's, it's not full-blown ro- romance but you know I, I, if there's ever been a relationship amongst arch enemies it's it's these two and and mm-hmm. it's been there you know since since as far as I can remember, uh, White Knight kind of highlights it a little bit more. Um, and I'm okay with that. You know, again, don't, I'm not a shipper. Uh, 
you you won't ever <laughs> you won't ever see me cross that line. But you know, there there is you know there's something with those two again to where you know, like in Killing Joke, they're destined to battle each other forever. I think that you guys raise excellent points, and I think that. Uh... I, I don't understand why you would have to make it romantic. I think it is undeniably true. I think it is a fact that the Joker is uniquely fascinated by Batman. I One of the reasons I don't like the killing joke is because I don't think Batman reciprocates that obsession. I think Batman... I, I like the line from The Dark Knight. <laughs> You're... Um, oh, what is it? You're garbage who murders for money. Um, and I like that Batman in this story doesn't have those moments where he's like on the roof of um, Arkham with Joker at the end of Killing Joke and shares a little laugh with the Joker. He, he never does that. He never has that moment where he's in sympathy. He hates the Joker because the Joker hurts the people he loves. He hurts Gotham. He hurts Alfred. He hurts Barbara. He hurts Jim. He hurts people he loves. And that to me is Batman's is, is the correct way to write Batman in relationship to the Joker. I don't think that, um, that you have to make the Joker romantically obsessed with Batman to have the the scene where he doesn't know what to do with himself after he beats Batman have dramatic weight. I think that's actually a really cool relationship moment because it's something we're never really going to see. We're never really going to see the Joker beat Batman in the main continuity. So seeing him do so and then not knowing what to do with himself, I don't think you have to push it to romantic. I just think it's natural. I mean, it's sort of like uh, End of Princess Bride where Inigo Montoya says, <laughs> you know, I've spent my whole life based on revenge. What should I do now? Uh, the Joker spent his whole life trying to destroy the Batman. Now that he's done that, what does he do now? Doesn't have to be romantic at all. So I think that that relationship is, is well handled here. Um, I would say so something like the Lego Batman does actually push it into a romantic one, but that's much more comedic and, and silly. So... <laughs> Actually, you know, I was looking up these both the Lego Batman movie and this came out about the same time. Lego Batman, I think, came out a couple months earlier. But like, I think in this book are the lines is we have no relationship. <laughs> I hate you. And it's almost like almost I got a verbatim feel <laughs> for the Lego Batman movie. Except that Lego Batman at the end sort of does embrace Joker. <laughs> oh, no, it, it does. It does. It's so great. And in, in its way, in as much as Batman can, like it, it sort of is. I mean, he he drives along with him in his car, and then he saves his life. You know, that's practically a hug in Batman's world. <laughs> You're not wrong, but I don't. <laughs> I I wouldn't say that it's, and, and I would say that Batman in his mind is saving Jack. He's not saving Joker. Oh yes. Oh yeah. No, you're you're right. You're right. No, no. I agree. I'm just being silly. Uh, but you you do point out a good point that he does save Joker or Jack's life, which is also Joker's life at that point. So I I think that there there are some really interesting things. I I think that possibly one of the reasons that this series isn't a favorite of mine is that it doesn't necessarily touch on the things that I really enjoy seeing, but it does do a lot of things very well. There are a lot of thematic explorations like that relationship between Batman and the Joker and the Joker and Harley in particular that I. Th that I think are adding something to the mythos. So this is one of those rare occasions where something is really acclaimed and it's by a writer and artist. So another example, of course, is Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. And that's going to come up a lot of times in this conversation because Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns was supposed to be, at the very least, the future. It's not supposed to be the current Batman. And this is also a much older Batman. This is a Batman who's been around for a really long time. I'd say he's in his 50s. And he is losing Alfred, just as in The Dark Knight Returns, he loses Alfred. He is trying to figure out a way to end his war on crime. And all that to say, this is a unique thing that in that it's a, a writer-artist. So let's talk a bit about the art. 
I'd say that Sean Gordon Murphy is one of the top artists out there in comics and definitely one of the top Batman artists. What are some moments that you think are just really great? I didn't love the art style. I definitely like it better than The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> no offense. Flash, a little offense. But, um, and it is a little scratchy for me, but all in all, like, as scratchy as it is, like, he does do very good characters, and, and they're all distinguishable. Doing the two Harleys must have been rough. <laughs> I'm so glad he gave them slightly different shades of blonde, because otherwise I don't think I would have been able to tell them the difference. Other than one has glasses and one doesn't. No, I really liked it. I don't know if there's any one panel or whatever that really stuck out or anything. Nora is always beautiful, of course. But I really like the variant cover at the end of the of the trade paperback. I get all the variant covers, and those are all pretty cool. But I don't I don't think there's any one that I like in particular. Yeah, I didn't get I didn't get for some reason when when the issues came out, I didn't get any of the variants. But I made sure in uh, Curse that I. There are several issues where I have both covers. Um, I am I've I've been a fan of Murphy's for a while, um, and I definitely love the art in here. Um, the the tone of the colors from Hollingsworth really, you know, set the tone uh, throughout the series. Um, you know, one of the things that I particularly love, and it's something that we 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 see often in uh, Batman comics is even in panels in which Bruce is, is present, you know, he's not in the cow. You know, if he's walking around and, and there's a shadow, that shadow isn't of Bruce Wayne, that shadow is of Batman. And Murphy kind of took it a step further, you know, a few times where you see Jack Mm-hmm. Walking or being in the shadows, the shadow isn't of Jack Napier. It's 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 of the Joker. Mm-hmm. So you know those little touches really, really bring to light that you know, no matter where they are and, and what they're doing and and what persona they're taking on at the time, in the end, they still are those two characters that that have this history, this rich history between the two. Absolutely. I I would say that one of the things I love about Murphy is he has a really distinct style. It's it's very sketchy and angular, but it also has a lot of detail, so it's not too cartoony. And I really enjoy the way he creates landscapes and he loves cars, like he's a, a gearhead in real life. And so he draws lots of Batmobiles and other vehicles and technology like the freeze cannon. I also think he does do some really good emotional moments. Um, Like, of course, when Alfred dies, you know, Batman's reaction to that was very powerful. So there's just lots of great art. And it's clear to me that Murphy spends a lot of time thinking how to tell the story, not just what the story is, but how to convey that to us, the reader, through the visual medium of comics. And it's not just a matter of panel to panel, but like where in the panel do you put your eye and how do things move from one panel to the other? And where's the weight on a page with all the panels put together? So there's just a real sense that this is a carefully crafted book. And, And I do appreciate that. I think that's not often seen. I mean, comics being a monthly business oftentimes people do their best and they they often create accidental magic but it's rare to find something where it just really feels like everything is on purpose so i I would definitely say that it's just a a really good artistic piece for for batman here and i kind of want to retract my statement a little bit it's not necessarily my favorite art as in like most like jaw dropping this is amazing but my favorite panel in the whole series i think is in the 7th issue where dick and barbara and bruce are all hugging and they are just sharing a moment remembering alfred and loving each other and i thought that was so cute because dick had been a bit of a jerk <laughs> <laughs> that that is a really nice moment and it does sort of build up and 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 Dick was a jerk from the first issue because I remember if, in the first issue when 
when they're all chasing Joker and, and he comes swooping in on the motorcycle, he's in front of all of the other guys, the construction workers, and he's calling Babs Babs in full costume. And I'm like, that drove me crazy. What are you doing? They all did that to each other, <laughs> the whole thing. Like, and I noted, like, every time they were in costume, they would call each other by their real first names. And any time they were out of costume, they'd call each other by their mass persona. I was like, are you, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Jerks. It drove me crazy. So something that was a bit of a controversy was... Originally, and if you look at Murphy's Twitter and some of his other, uh, maybe Instagram and some of his art um, posting media, showed Harley Quinn in the nude during the scene that Harley proposes to Joker. They they have just made love. And this was originally an M-rated comic for mature audiences only. It wasn't supposed to be just for teens. And it was retroactively added to DC's Black Label, which is sort of their R-rated label. Um, <laughs> well, and that's that's what we're going to talk about. And in White Knight, he attempted to have some more nudity, and that was, again, censored. Do you think that either the nudity or the censoring detracts from the story, or do you think the nudity or the censoring were necessary to the market and the audience they are trying to attract? I don't know. Like... In this, I'm trying to find it, and I'm having trouble finding it right now. But, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I think a scene like that is just nudities for nudity's sake. And I'm okay with them censoring it. Because it's like, there's no... There's not many plot reasons why you have to be naked in a scene. <laughs> like, in real life, you don't normally go walking around your house naked. To be fair, they're not, they're not walking around the house. They're in bed. And they're just, you know, just getting a proposal. But... And not everyone has that L-shaped sheet that they have in movies and TV shows. Wait, are you are you telling me that they don't make his and her sheets where it reaches up they to the don't. top of a woman and it's just to the bottom of a man? Yeah, like, no, those, those they don't really make those. Well, they do in TV and shows. But um, I don't, I don't really care. I think I said this about the the what was it the the. The curse one. I didn't read that one. I just read the. I just read the Bat Paula issue, and then I got bored and didn't. Oh, you mean Batman Damned? <laughs> Batman Damned, Bat Paul. And it's just there's no point. Like, okay, it's his Bat Cave. He can, he can be naked. That's fine. Whatever. But I don't. I'm European. That's what I said for the Bat Paul issue. I'm European. I don't care. Be nude. But when it's something like this, you almost know they. Because they obviously didn't do for the clicks, right? Because well, this isn't marketed as Batman White Knight. There's nudity in it. It's like, it's just one page in the whole thing. I think Americans are too sensitive. <laughs> we need more topless beaches to make us less sensitive to this kind of stuff. I don't know. Not right now, we don't. Not right now, we don't. Don't go to the beach. <laughs> Silly Floridians. But I don't. I don't think it was marketed enough. To it to be whatever the purchasing version of clickbait is, but I don't really think it's necessary or unnecessary. It's just there. I don't know. Did it sell more because it had nudity? Probably not. Well, it didn't have nudity, so. Well, uh, well, they're pretty close. There's some very strategically placed speech bowls. Yeah. What do you think, <laughs> Theo? <laughs> I see more Joker butt than I ever wanted to see in my life. But basically, what what not to not to make it too much of a of a conversation of of how you know of how the book should have been because again it was it was slated as a book for mature audiences. Um, you know, but once it once it was decided that it would be for teens, of course it it would have to come out. Um, I hope that as this this universe continues in in under the black la- black label um, imprint, that you know he's Murphy's given a little bit more leeway in what he's allowed to do. Now, of course, that would mean getting all of that past um, 
the AT and T overlords, and we we know how <laughs> that all went down with Batman Damned. But you know, yeah, I I don't I don't have that strong of of an opinion about whether or not you know nudity for one panel, you know, sparking an uproar that it did. And, it is what it is. It's a teen book. Teen books can have nudity. You know, if, if it was ever to be a, a, a mature book and people started complaining about that, then, you know, that's an entirely different conversation. My own take is that I did not feel that the nudity either in this book or in Curse of the White Knight was necessary. Um, I also think that the censorship was awkward. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds. I think that the nudity here was unnecessary, but the fixing of it was awkward because some of those speech bubbles are just like, well, okay, especially since I've seen the original art. So I know what was there. And <laughs> it just feels very distracting from the actual storytelling. Um, I I think in the second miniseries, Curse of the White Knight, I would honestly put more responsibility on Murphy because he knows that DC doesn't want to do it. However, I think that the fact that uh, White Knight sold so well for DC should have given him a bit more leeway, you know? This is in their black label. It's for mature audiences only. If they're going to let him do that, I don't understand why they should awkwardly censor him the second time. On the other hand, I do think that Murphy should have known that they probably would try and censor him and maybe not force the issue by drawing nudity in the second series. So it's, it's complicated and twisty. I personally wish they'd just avoided the whole issue and not had the nudity. Get some of those L-shaped seats and we'll be fine and it won't feel as awkward. <laughs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but if for some reason, like swearing, you know, mature swearing or or nudity or whatever is part of the story or it enhances the story, that's fine. I mean, whatever. But if you're throwing in there just to cause a ruckus and we can all acknowledge, no matter how we felt about it, the bat pull caused. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, I don't know, the cash grab for me, and it bothers me. I don't know. It's like, that's not good storytelling. That's good clickbait. And that's not a story. But I felt that the story was good enough, and I felt like the writing was good enough that I was not too horribly distracted by the beach bubble bra. <laughs> lots, lots of beach, beach bubble, bubble bra. bra. <laughs> she also have a she has a shadow bra in one of the panels. So moving on from the the controversy, and there's there's not really a resolution. I was just curious because it it was something that Murphy was clearly very intent on doing, and DC was just as intent on not letting him do that. So, do you think that this story stands up next to other great Elseworlds titles like The Dark Knight Returns, or Let's see, was, uh, what's that big one in the 90s? Kingdom Come. Gotham by Gaslight. Gotham by Gaslight. Like, does this stand up next to those ones as a Batman story that will last in readers' hearts, even though it's not in main continuity? I don't know about, like, epicness, because, I mean, <laughs> Batman in Victorian England is just so cool. <laughs> Like, that was so different. Like, that really stands out. Or even, not that it's going to be the best of our time, but Deceased was pretty awesome because, man, there was no halls barred there. It's like, everyone's dead and it's wonderful. <laughs> and and being able to do whatever you want in a universe, that's pretty cool. I think that's a freedom that allows for better storytelling that I like better. I mean, I love what Tynion's doing. I love what King did. Later, eh. <laughs> but that they're all they're all in the shackles of you need to keep certain status quo. Whereas these can just go nuts 
which is why I love Deceased and I loved Injustice, is because they could just go crazy with whatever they wanted to do. Well, they. <laughs> Tom, Tom Taylor. There's just the one. And so this, I really liked, and I think, I mean, this is something, again, that... I, I'm very stingy. I don't buy a lot of comics. This is one that I bought because I really enjoyed what he did with the freedom he had to write a brand new Batverse. And and I liked it. And so I don't know if, you know, the rest of the world will love it forever, but it's something that's going on my shelf and I really liked it. And I'm not buying the curse or not the curse. Um 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 the one we were just talking about, Batman Forever? No. Batman. Damned. Damned. No, 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 not that one. <laughs> That's only living in certain people's. You're definitely not oh. buying that one. What's, ugh, crap. Who's the one who's so famous? Dark Knight Returns. Yes, that one. Thank you, Dark Knight Returns. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion is made no, no, no. <laughs> no. That's my opinion. You can, I know oh. I'm in the minority. Oh, I know. It. Oh. I'll be by myself. I mean, I, I respect Batman, <laughs> The Dark Knight Returns, but I don't love it. Oh, yes. No. Jeez. So I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of those people that do not consider The Dark Knight Returns Elseworld. I consider that continuity. I can, and I know there are some creators who have considered... The Dark Knight Returns continuity, especially from a futuristic standpoint. Now, of course, there's there are some plot holes because, of course, there's also Batman Beyond. Um, but for me, I've always I've always known Dark Knight Returns to be the future of this Bruce Wayne. Um, but I've always loved alternate universes, whether it's whether it's Elseworlds, whether it's deceased, uh, you can you can give Tom Taylor any book that allows him to just right. kill everyone, and you know <laughs> he has the best job. In, he has the best job in comics right now, killing he everyone. Does. Um, because it allows them, it it allows these creators to have more artistic freedom to mm -hmm. really do some stuff that the constraints of main continuity will not allow. Um, and, you know, you see that in White Knight, you see it in Deceased. I mean, who would ever thought that they would see Batman and the entire Bat family all laid across the floor of the, of the Bat Cave, you know, taken out by Alfred. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there have been some bad Elseworld books, but there have been a lot more good Elseworld books. Uh, and it, it, it's simply because, because of the, the, the freedom that creators are given to not consider continuity as mm -hmm. they lay these pages out. And it just makes the story so much better. So keep doing it, Murphy, and give more books to Tom Taylor. <laughs> yes. So I think that this story is sort of the opposite of um, The Dark Knight Returns. I think Frank Miller is a powerful artist. He's an artist who knows how to use light and shadow in a way that very few artists know how to use. And for that reason, even though I don't, like the art in The Dark Knight Returns, I respect it and I am moved by it. But I think that it's really the writing, just his rough voice and the structuring of the story and the way that he gets the feelings to the readers of the characters that set it apart, that make it one of the greatest Batman stories um, of all time, even though my favorite is, of course, um, Year One. But almost every... Well, okay. Both Scott Snyder and Tom King have said that The Dark Knight Returns is the best Batman story ever written. And these are not people who have, you know, no ego and they have no great Batman stories of their own. Like them or not, I think that 
everyone would acknowledge that both Bat, Tom King and Scott Snyder have written some of the, the most influential and best known, if not best loved, stories of the last 10 years. And both of them have said that Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, they, they look at that as the mountain that they can't top. And I think that's mostly because of the writing expressed through the art. And I would say that this is sort of the reverse. It's the art expressed, and then the writing sort of supports that. I'm not, I'm not sure if I see this taking on the kind of life that The Dark Knight Returns did. No. Um, just because The Dark Knight Returns came at that point when DC was rebooting and the universe was very flexible and it, it really came into a place where they were reshaping Batman in a way that you can't reshape Batman now. Like you can argue that Tom King and Scott Snyder both try and, and Grant Morrison too, but all trying to reshape Batman, but they were doing so after 20 to 30 years of Batman being really defined in the 90s and early 2000s is who he is. And you can't change Batman anymore the way you could in the mid-80s. So I don't think that we're going to quite see this be the Dark Knight Returns of its day. But I do think that going forward, it is going to be an influence. We'll have to wait and see. I've already pointed out something I think is an influence, which is the creation of Punchline. But I could be wrong. We'll have to wait and see, as I said. So. Just to give you a small thing. So I think the Dark Knight Returns, when did that come out? Early 90s? Dark Knight Returns was, I believe, uh, 86 or 88. Oh, okay. well, never mind. Yeah, yeah. So, so we don't have numbers for that at all because the, we don't have numbers until like 96, I think. But I do have numbers for Dark Knight, re the Master Race, and Strikes Again. And, I mean, the average sales on those is like 160,000 to 170,000. Like, I mean, I think you can admit that most people didn't think they were quite as good as the original. And even they sold like hotcakes. Whereas White Knight, at its best, was selling 86,000. So, and I think um, Master Race Issue 1 sold 440,000 thousand <laughs> so not you can't right, even with all, with all of the variants yeah like you can't even compare the two really by by sales and by um i mean you can't compare them they're completely different <laughs> um by by sales and, and in what regard fans uh hold it so even though they did really good dark knight strikes again i was only oh i mean it was three issues still kept you know was selling almost as much when it finished that when it started. So like, yeah, it's definitely got more legacy power than, than this, than the white knight does. Definitely. I always tend to ignore, uh, strikes again for good reason. <laughs> as you should, that um, thing is so unfun to read. <laughs> but I mean, that's just the thing is it did that well, and it's not even a good book. <sighs> I mean, so, and, and I guess the other thing you have to consider is, is you know, back then when when Dark Knight Returns came out, you know, and 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 Ian's right, that was back in the eighties. It was eighty six. You 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 didn't have comics printing the way that they are now, you know. Um, so it kind it, it's kind of hard to 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 put in the same light. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at what happened with year one and then you look at also what happened with Dark Knight Return, this was kind of the turning point where, you know, Batman surpassed Superman as being DC's guy, DC's big seller. And you, you, you see it today in, in the numbers where even even if the book is horrible, if the name Batman appears on it, mm -hmm. um, it it's going to sell. I mean, and you even see it in other genres when you look at, when you look at movies, you know, for example, uh, Justice League Dog, Batman was in there a few scenes, and, but because he was there, it sold. 
you know, you, you slap Batman anywhere on it, it's going to sell. And um, no matter how good or how bad it is. Um, well, then I also say that you, something we don't often talk about is Joker also sells. And so the fact that White Knight has both Batman and Joker so prominently definitely helps its sales. And I think that's possibly a reason why Curse of the White Knight didn't quite work also. as well. Harley also sells. Well, she sells now. She didn't in the mid 2000s, but since 2013, she sold a lot. Still don't like her. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's a good question, Har. Let's let's ask that question. How do you think this Harley Quinn, not Neo Joker, who I would say is the the modern Harley, this? What do you think of classic Harley in this story? Because she's very different. She is. And I liked her in this one because she's not, other than the one proposal scene, you know, she's not a, a sex symbol so much as just in love with Jack. And and she's just very clear about her intentions and her love. It's like she's not in love with Joker. She's in love with Jack in spite of Joker, which is still not healthy. <laughs> and I think both both Harleys admit that their love is not very healthy. <laughs> but I like her. She's not as over the top and she's definitely not zany like this is a mellowed out calm not that's repetitive word she's a reformed harley who's who's just wants her her husband and her 2.5 kids and her picket fence um and i i mean i like that it's a different side of her and it's it's an interesting take she definitely wouldn't sell a solo title like our current Harley Quinn does, but I liked her. Mainly because I, like Theo, am not a Harley fan. <laughs> so, and I'm not sure if, if, if you guys will agree or not, but for some reason, when, when I looked at both Harleys, it really had me thinking about what we just covered in Harley. And so Holly, I saw as Harleen from that series, you know, she was just madly in love with the Joker. You know, like Steph said, despite the flaws, she was madly in love with him. And Neo Joker is the Holly we get by the end of the series. And, you know, who, who that for some reason, that's just what I see now, now that I've read the Harleen series. When I look at those two, I see I see Harley as as Harleen Quinzel, the person who falls madly in love with a, with a madman, despite the fact that he's a madman and have all these flaws. She genuinely loves him, who eventually just becomes this cuckoo um, for the cocoa puff that is Joker. Um, by the end, by the end of the book, and you know, and and, and that's the person who we get in Neo Joker. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I'm weird. I just did an episode for Patreon <laughs> about Harley Quinn, and I don't know if you guys have listened to it, but I broke Harley into three categories. There's Harley Quinn of the animated series, who's very ditzy, very in love with Joker, and kind of she's not her own character. And then you have the New 52 Harley. Oh, sorry, there's four categories. So you have the New 52 Harley, who's the Harley who's dark and edgy and murders children with bombs and video games. And she's very much very sexualized. Like, this is the Harley of the Arkham Asylum video games and the New 52 Suicide Squad. And then you have the Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor Harley Quinn, who's a force of chaos, but sort of a cheerful force of chaos. She's not... She, she's very violent. She does kill a lot of people, but she doesn't have the sadism and the femme fatale quality that the New 52 Harley did. And then you have this new direction that I would say, and I didn't think of this, but I would say that this Harley, the White Knight Harley, and the current ongoing Harley by Sam Humphreys, and um, the Harley Quinn cartoon are all attempting to do, which is sort of anti-hero Harley. She's still violent. She's still a destabilizing force. She's still an antagonist to Batman, but she's not a villain. She's not 100% interested in hurting people like 
the the new 52 or even the um, the animated series version is neither of those have any heroic qualities about them and harleen would also fit into this fourth category and the fact that the fourth category is so nebulous and undefined kind of is a problem because none of them are are winning none of the the versions of harley are really selling as much as the the three previous versions Mm -hmm. But I, I think that this is a compelling Harley. I kind of wish we'd seen her actually do do the planning and do the the oh, things yeah. that Batman says at the end. Because she, she sort of planned this whole thing. She knew that Jack was within Joker. She planned, she created the drugs that brought Jack out. She, she basically was the mastermind. And that's just sort of revealed. And it feels like an afterthought. Like you never see Harley doing these plans in the the story itself so it doesn't feel Mm -hmm. quite real um Mm -hmm. and i think that's just part of the writing i think murphy was learning writing you know as he was doing it and that was something that he intended but didn't quite convey to us the audience but i would say that harley is is very appealing here i don't think it's quite as appealing as harleen i think harleen is a more assured version of a more assured creation whereas Mm -hmm. this is a little hesitant in Mm -hmm. some ways but it's definitely I'd put it up against you know the Harley Quinn cartoon or the current ongoing for Harley Quinn. I think it's it's definitely a good creation, and I would like to see more of it. Spoilers for the next. She is a big part of Curse of the White Knight, so we'll get to talk more about her then. That sort of wraps up all the questions I had. Or did you have any last discussion points or questions you wanted to talk about before we end our show? I did want to highlight a couple of things. Bruce wearing the pink nightgown or the house coat and uh, finding uh, Jarvis, Jarvis and, um, oh, it's not Jarvis. Yes, it is. The Mad Hatter and, and Neo Joker in Wayne Manor was hilarious. And probably one of my highlights of the whole book <laughs> was him pretending to be an uh, airheaded billionaire playboy. Oh, and then one thing I was going to say, one of the big changes to a villain is that Clayface has always been just clay and he can just form himself however he wants and, you know, drain away into dirt. Whereas this Clayface actually has a brain, a brainstem, eyeballs and a tongue, and that's all he's got after the dirt is gone. (laughs) And it's so creepy. And I just love the scene where backpack op- or uh, Batman opens Neo Joker's backpack and just brainstem and the eyeballs pop out. <laughs> it's so gross. And I you absolutely it. love it. I absolutely loved it. It was so funny. It probably wasn't supposed to be, but even the look on Batman's face is like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <maybe. laughs> That's definitely a gag throughout this thing because it there's there's no way you can draw a tongue a brain and eyeballs and take it serious oh that's all i got <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, i'm gonna go back and i know i said you know that that the white knight universe needs to stay away from from the, the main dc continuity i'm just gonna make these two exceptions one and we already said mm-hmm. it before uh, age of Duke Thomas, please. You know, <laughs> that would, you know, make him more interesting. Get rid of the whole signal thing. Um, <laughs> and it, I would, I would like to see more of this human humanization of Victor Freeze that we see mm-hmm. in in White Knight. And I know in Detective that Tomasi touched upon it some where. You know, Victor helps Batman because, again, he's he, all he's worried about is saving his wife. And the only reason why uh, the only reason why he does the bad things that, is, that he does and that he did was to obtain what he needed to save Nora. So, you know, if, if we see more, you know, I know he's he's under stasis now, but if we ever see more. Um, Victor Freeze in, in the main Batman universe. I would like to see it uh, take more of a humanizing tone and we see more of, of the Victor Freeze from uh, the White Knight universe in the, in the main universe. But more Sean Murphy, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to get some because he has been a good seller and he has been a, a, a good advocate. He's reached out to, 
to fans and customers on social media and been a generally positive force in the DC community, I would say. Yeah, he just dropped the, he just dropped the uh, graphic novel on Indiegogo. Oh, and what's so, it called? Yeah. Oh, I can't remember. I, I, I can't remember. The only reason why I can't remember is because I'm upset because he didn't put it on Kickstarter. Because <laughs> uh, I, I usually, I'm usually on Kickstarter more than Indiegogo. I haven't created an account here yet. But uh, yeah, it's been out, I want to say about a week now. That's been out. I'll, I'll try to find the name. In. Okay, I think it's called The Plot oh. Holes. I believe that is it. But yeah, if you like the art on here, and I definitely did, you should check out that, see if it's something you'd want to uh, you know, purchase or support, or even just check out from the library or comic store when it's out. Yeah, so that wraps up our coverage of the first miniseries, Batman White Knight. If you're impatient for more TBU coverage of Sean Murphy's or Murphyverse, as he calls it, check out our Patreon, become a Patreon, and listen to uh, Steph... Chris and I cover the Von Fries one-shot. It's a lengthy one-shot, so we do get some substantial coverage there, some good thoughts. We really love that. I definitely would recommend checking out that episode and that one-shot. And then in two weeks, we'll be covering Curse of the White Knight, the sequel to this story, and we'll get more Murphy. And then, in the month of June, we'll have the double celebration of our 300th episode and the return of normal comics for the Batman universe. Thank you to our patrons and supporters. Uh, the Bat Fan Appreciation Wall today lists Gerald Green, Donald Townsend, Tim Garassi, Captain America, Karinas, Mary Garrett, Real No Deuces, Stanton's Grave, Brendan Roberts, Donovan Morgan Grant, Ed Grouse, Rob O, Ian Miller, Arturo Juarez, Stephanie Mounts, Joshua Lappin Bertoni, Hannah Gar, and Johnny McCloskey. Thanks for your support. You help us keep the podcast going. So. Yay. No more comments. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, for the Batman Universe Comic Podcast, I have been Ian. And this is Steph. And this is Theo. And thanks for listening. We'll see you in a couple weeks. 